so the show stopper session actually i don't know whoever have been usa members when it was happening in the group it was supposed to be a shoe stopper selling by type of error so then you're wondering whether it matches it or not but then ultimately it, it, the session is meant to be where the show gets stopped and everybody has a jaw dropped appearance and what is happening on the screen okay that was the intention and then uh, people uh, this was because of purely because of dr somshila's efforts that this uh, session has been brought in because there are too many takers and asking for i think so hopefully it's going to be it's meant to be what's new in uvet is research imaging investigations and jaw dropping it's it's split up into two sessions the one half the first half will be on uh, talks and other things about what's happening what what's happening and what you need to make it happen and what you need to take about it second half is about uh, cases which are uh, show stopping okay so so to start off i have any uh, we'll call the chair and co-chair a president and vice president of uvet society of india heads of uvet is an ocular immunology of vitala and uh, narayan netralia dr kalpana and padma yeah both from bangalore yeah so we um, we didn't want to have a bias so we are having dr radhika as co moderator who is not from karnataka okay and uh, we'll probably take turns welcome all to the session uh, i may i now invite the first speaker dr soumya basu he will be talking to us on what to test and how much to believe 8 minutes sir good so i'll get started straight away so what i'm I covering in this talk you. is uh, <laughs> why do we test how best we use our tests and the concept of pre test probability i think those few people who are here if you can take this concept with you my job will be done I'm not going to talk about the so called uvitis work up and if you want to know more about what uh, i'm talking today you will find it in these two papers uh, especially the first one which i think should be read by anybody practicing any kind of uveitis so why do we investigate uveitis this question has to be asked because many infectious as well as uh, a lot of non infectious uveitis are actually diagnosed by the clinical pattern alone and this includes almost all retinitis entities except the spirochetes and bartonella because you know uh, these are all based on clinical pattern recognition and not not any blood tests even for example the viral anti uveitis fuchs uveitis these are all clinical diagnosis they don't need a test similarly test many of the non infectious conditions are also based on pattern recognition and i put b27 in brackets because although by definition it's based on a blood test there are patients where you recognize by the clinical pattern and not by the blood test which can be negative so the reason we why, why we want to test are to rule out or rule in an infection or a systemic disease and sometimes to look for some of the baseline parameters like the immune status fitness for therapy and also for monitoring the uh, treatment response now when we do a test how do you find out how good is your test now i have put two questions here one is if the disease is present will the test be positive the other question is if the test is positive is the disease present so which of these two questions do you think is relevant to us in the in the clinic if you ask me i would say it's the second one because the patient doesn't come to you with a diagnosis of the disease the patient comes to you with a positive or a negative test so it's the second point which is going to be more relevant and this is called the positive predictive value so we all keep talking about how sensitive or specific a test is that's actually not important what is important is the positive predictive value because the patient is not coming to you with the diagnosis is coming to you with a positive or a negative test 
For example, this case scenario, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis, acute unilateral recurrent inflammatory back pain, for some reason the TPHA comes out to be positive. So what do you go? Go after the TPHA or go after the clinical pattern? Now, if you ask me, TPHA actually has a very high sensitivity and specificity. Okay, so do we believe that? No, because if the uh, this means that if the prevalence of syphilis in acute recurrent alternating non-granulomatous antiviritis is just one in ten thousand, remember the clinical background that we are looking at, then the positive predictive value is only one person. So your TPH has very little role, even if it it is positive and even if it's a very good test in this case. So this is where the understanding of pretest probability comes into the picture and that is the prevalence of the disease before you order the test. And this will be based on the prevalence in the population, the ocular signs you are looking at, the patient profile, immune status, etc. Similarly, if the prevalence is low, the ocular signs are opposing. For example, if you have granulomatous KPs, you're not going to think about B27 even if your test is positive, right? And the patient profile. So, how to convert the pretest probability to a post test probability? This for this you need what is called as a likelihood ratio, which is a combination of the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. And I have in fact put one of Dr. Kalpana's paper here where the sensitivity and specificity of quantiferon TB gold test in the diagnosis of ocular TB was mentioned. Based on these values, I calculated the positive likelihood ratio and this we found to be 3.42 based on this particular study. So the way we convert the pretest probability to post-test probability, we use something called as a Fagan's nomogram, which you may not use in the clinic, but it shows why this concept is so important. So if the central row is of the likelihood ratio, and if you put that red dot there for the 3.42, now if you see if the pretest probability is low, for example, non-granulomatous and anterior uveitis, history of inflammatory back pain, no TB contact. Then if you connect it to the likelihood ratio, your post-test probability is just 10%. Now, if the pretest probability is slightly higher, intermediate uveitis, you know, then your post-test probability goes to 60%. But serpiginous like choroiditis, a history of TB contact, and you have got a negative TPHA and test for sarcoid, now your post-test probability goes very high with the same likelihood ratio. With the same test, based on your pre-test probability, your post-test probability has gone so very high. Okay, so I, I think if you have understood this slide, my job is really done. Two tests which are done very commonly in, cl in clinical practice, ANA and rheumatoid factor. How useful are they in your uveitis patients? I'm not talking about scleritis here. Now you see the prevalence of SLE in a uveitis patient is just that much from 0 0.5 to 0.7% similar values for rheumatoid arthritis. So even if your test is positive and there are no other systemic signs of SLE, your positive predictive value for a positive ANA in a patient with uveitis is just 4.4%. What do you do with that value? Nothing. It has absolutely zero relevance. Same thing with rheumatoid factor. Positive predictive value for just 0.7 to 2.45%. Zero relevance in a patient of uveitis provided there are no other systemic signs of the disease. Okay. So please let us stop using these tests if there are no other systemic signs of these diseases. Okay. The last concept I want to con uh, convey here is the opposite of positive predictive value which is uncertainty. And this uh, I have bought, you know, there's a new concept that I've learned myself and it's given very well in this paper by Russ van Gelder. Now uncertainty is basically when you either have a very low or a very high pretest probability. For example, uh, I, I, I'll talk about the very high pretest probability, serpiginous like choroiditis, okay, typical lesions, very, very, very likely to be TB, okay. 
Now, if your diagnostic tests for TB are negative in that patient, then you have a very high false omission rate. Similarly, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis with the inflammatory back pain, you get a positive TPHA test. Okay, then you have a high false discovery rate. So th these are concepts which we actually face very commonly in our clinical practice. And you know, we should be able to understand use them as the time comes. Okay, not get carried away by the positive, uh, negative, or uh, uh, you know, values or positive values. So this was one patient who responded very well to uh, and you know, corticosteroids alone. You see the choroiditis lesion there, and uh, this fellow came back with a, this huge recurrence like this. Okay, he was treated with steroids because the MONTU test was negative. And this patient, when we have treated with ATT alone, you can see how the lesion has, you know, kind of melted away completely with ATT alone. All right. So why do we screen when we, we screen when the disease can present with any form of uveitis? It needs a lab test for diagnosis. The test should have high sensitivity and specificity, and the treatment should be markedly different from other uh, uveitis entities. And there are just two conditions that fit into the need for screening. These are sarcoid and syphilis. Okay, the summary is the patient is always more important than the test. The positive and negative predictive values are more important than the sensitivity or specificity. And let us carry the understanding of pretest probability from here and also of uncertainty, false discovery and omission. And finally, very limited role of screening of or uveitis workup that we keep on doing in our practice. Thanks for your attention. Thank Sorry you, about the extra minute. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Basu. That was an excellent talk. Uh, I, w I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Vishwas, sir, to make some comments on this. Many of the time, the laboratory tests are done unnecessarily. So, for example, you know that uh, um, serology for the herpes group of viruses is often done, which is a ubiquitous virus, and it has got really no value in uh, such t uh, test. Uh, SLE testing also, as is mentioned to you, is done routinely in many cases, like you know, coronitis case, SLE. Uh, test ANA testing is done. So one need to be very careful uh, about the ordering the laboratory test, particularly the interpretation of the test. Clinical picture we need to keep it in mind and then see that whether that it fits to the pretest probability. Thank you, sir. Um, I mean, like I think for once, uh, all of us realize that these words sensitivity, specificity positive predictive value or all English words after he explained because it always used to be thinking that they are going above our head so this is the first time probably I understood that these are simple and I don't think anybody can make it more simpler thank you uh, so we have our I don't know high energy most enthusiastic Abhilasha presenting about image associated quantitative acta for UVT specialist uh, thank you UVI to society and thank you Dr. Somshila for the kind uh, uh, kind opportunity to present uh, this talk on image a software assisted quantitative OCTA. Uh, so we all know that optical coherence tomography angiography is a useful tool for our uveitis practice and especially in follow up uh, because it is a non invasive uh, test. Uh, quantitative OCTA analysis is essential to standardize objective interpretation of clinical outcomes. Uh, like when we see that there is ischemia, if we are able to quantify it, we can compare it with uh, uh, patients. We know we are seeing it, we are seeing the improvement, but if we can quantify, we can compare. Quantitative OCTA biomarkers are being used very commonly in diabetic retinopathy and uh, AMD. It involves procedures for quantitative feature uh, extraction. So you see a normal, uh, you see a scan, a standard scan, uh, and you can convert it into, you can binarize the image and you can see the blood vessels and uh, uh, non-perfusion areas clearly. And then you can skeletonize the 
uh, blood vessels and uh, you can isolate the foveal avascular zone. So all this has been used in uh, diabetic retinopathy. So segmentation is commonly performed using manual or semi-manual processes which are very complex and uh, many times we follow these uh, studies and we are not able to understand what is happening and quantitative analysis is done using commercially available software like MATLAB which is expensive and uh, when you are not in an institute you might not and you don't have funding you might be able to afford it so we have to look for an alternative an easy alternative for your cases uh, where you can solve your problems so uh, 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 image software is a java based image processing program developed by wine raspan in the national institute of health and it can display edit analyze process and save and print 8 bit images uh, so image software has been used previously but i will show you how what different i am doing now so you can uh, download this uh, from google and uh, whichever image you want to select you can open that image so you go to file and open the image here next uh, in the image section go to type and convert the uh, image into an 8 bit image so uh, an 8 bit image means that it has got uh, 256 scales of gray so 0 is black and 255 is white so traditionally what is being done is that image J software is used to binarize the image so you have either 0 or you have 1 so there is no uh, in between but we all know that Okta has a lot of uh, artifacts so with eye movement motion artifacts may come and you might not uh, uh, the 0 and 1 may not be actually correct so you get this 8-bit uh, image and then you have to apply the threshold function so once you apply the threshold function you can actually apply so, so the threshold in this image I have applied is 50 so from 0 to 220 uh, to 255 I have applied 50 so all the gray uh, levels which are darker than 50 are selected so now this can be my threshold for all the patients of this particular disease entity and then I can compare the level of ischemias in uh, different patients so here you we are getting the percentage area of ischemia so now like for the uh, example this is a case of uh, ampigenous choroiditis at presentation uh, on healing we we use this fundus autofluorescence and we are seeing that okay the, it is uh, scarred and the patient vision has improved uh, in the flow signal also uh, at presentation we see a lot of ischemia there and post healing uh, you can see subjectively that you know that okay flow signal has improved and even on this uh, choriocapillary scan the ischemia seems to be quite less but when you actually quantify it you will see that uh, from 46 percent ischemia it has come down to only 43.63 percent so now we exactly know how much ischemia has is uh, how much uh, it has reperfused how much of ischemia has improved so this I have also applied in my cases of uh, rickettsial retinitis just in the morning I presented this so uh, the first panel shows the fundus photographs and post healing this is the uh, OCTA scan of the superficial capillary plexus and uh, these areas of ischemia co-localize with the areas of retinitis and when you see you can quantify on the threshold function you can quantify the ischemia and compare between two groups so this group one is toxi group and group two is steroid group and we can objectively compare that the steroid group has more ischemia and we have applied the same threshold for both the uh, groups so future directions um, we can make uh, when when we have large data sets we can make uh, algorithms for various biomarkers like we have inflammatory cnbms we have uh, retinal ischemia or choroidal ischemia we can make biomarkers and uh, in future whether we like it or not uh, we'll have to uh, know about ai based uh, quantitative octa which is mo uh, mostly based on machine learning and learning based algorithms require data to tune parameters and perform effectively so like uh, drcr net uh, they are actually capturing uh, diabetic retinopathy and they are actually doing this quantitative uh, octa um, 
but uh, those software is not accessible so we can try this and uh, i'd like to acknowledge my husband's contribution to my questions <laughs> and uh, he searches answers for me uh, so and uh, inviting all of you to uber usicon at uh, abu dhabi it's i'm sure it's going to be a great program with our senior faculty and thank you yes please Excellent, uh, Habila Shah. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Padma Malini, ma'am, to just comment on her presentation? Yeah. Congratulations for the excellent work and thanks for sharing it. Yes, as we know that Image J is freely available and all of us can access and do the thing. What the difficulty we face in UVIT guys is the media haze and artifacts. Once we can come out of it, uh, then it's easy to calculate. And also the recent uh, OCT machines, they also have inbuilt software to calculate the areas of ischemia. And also it's happy to know that and your uh, proving that the doxycycline group did well compared to the steroid group, the ischemia is less. That's a very good information and goes well with the treatment. Thank Congratulations. You. I have a question, ma'am. Ma'am, how do you differentiate the edema causing the, uh, the hyporeflectivity on octa as compared to? See, you have to see the on first image and then you will know whether it is actually a true ischemia or uh, it is just caused due to the retinal uh, edema. So that is why uh, uh, when when I compared the rickets cell retinitis group, I waited for the lesions to heal. I think Dr. Sanjay Srinivasan has a series where they have done quantitative OCTA at presentation. So uh, now when you have these uh, algorithms, so uh, the machine will be able to differentiate uh, whether this is a a true flow void or this is shadowing so uh, those because in things the case that you presented ma'am the f you showed a very uh, minimal in, uh, improvement uh, yes. uh, in the ischemia probably mm -hmm. because initially it was more of edema showing the flow void mm -hmm. when there was already ischemia and mm -hmm. then uh, after the edema is resolved so the oct has flattened but the uh, ischemia is still present in that case. Uh, but actually I didn't show the whole scan when you are when there is shadowing you will see that shadow in all the uh, all the scans you can see the ischemia in, uh, the shadowing in all the scans thank you Abhilasha yeah uh, can we call Dr. Dipankar um, uh, he'll talk about immunology of stromal choreitis I mean we were all uh, scared of white dot syndromes during our PG and fellowship days and now like it's a little more uh, scary it becomes when you talk about immunology and name change so we'll see what he says thank you dr sudarshan uh, uh, respected chairpersons uh, my mentor professor um, uh, jb uh, sir and all here present basically if you see immunology in stromal choroiditis stromal choroiditis basically means vk sympathetic ophthalmia no, uh, the sarcoidosis, TB, or Basset disease. These are the constellations of uh, uh, syndromic or non-syndromic condition that affect the stroma of the choroid. Second important thing, which choroiditis causes CME? Okay, whether it's a B cell disease or a T cell disease, which are more, much more prominent. These are the some of the queries that we have in our mind. Uh, when you see pathological slides, when you see about immunological things. Now, uh, I do not have uh, any financial uh, disclosure in this presentation. Now, you see, this is a patient came in COVID uh, with a chronic EVATs. Now, we can well appreciate there is a uh, iris atrophy and a tessellated fundus to meet dilated people immediately you know pan is which is causing uh, probably a leakage in this case and you can well um, uh, saw in SOCT the uh, KPs uh, in this and this we published uh, in IGO about the finding here now we see the chronicity of the disease in the tessellated fundus 
and obviously as uh, Avilash has showed, imaging is very, very important and these are the ICGs in different frames showing the activities of the diseases. This is again an incomplete VKH with uh, the flows and angiography with a pinpoint dot and letter flows and this is a comparative ICG with the flows and angiography here with uh, multi placoid lesions here. Now this is what is very important no we can discuss lot of in depth for immunological aspect but what is important let us see one thing what is the acute disease what is a chronic disease in chrom chrom uh, uh, choroidal stroma and what is a t cell and the b cell manifestation of this now in pattern of ev it is from northeast india we have uh, seen uh, 14 cases of BKH in one year and one case of sympathy of telomere sarcoidosis in nine and TB choroiditis were not seen. But in 2015, when doing a pattern of EVAT, uh, BKH was 10, sympathy of telomere was 14, sarcoidosis 30, and TB 19 in a population of Northeast India. Now, this is a case when block was sent by JBSAT to me to do immunohistochemistry in our lab of a VKH patient. See, VKH, we do not get a histopathological sample, but this is a very, very rare and we have published from the Indian scenario for the first time. You see the stromal choroiditis here and uh, diffuse plasma lymphocytic cells in the choroid and these are the patient was previously in that thysicalized was a CNVM and no, we have demonstrated CNVM in this and this placoid lesion and the uh, fluid accumulation pockets that are uh, seen in the histopathology here uh, and you see the photoreceptors degeneration is there. Now same thing RP undulation and retinal gliosis was evident in this case. Now coming to uh, the immunology here CD3 which is a marker for T cell was plus 3 and CD20 was plus 3. So it is basically a T cell disease that we have seen in this case. And this we have subsequently published in peer reviewed journal. Another important thing again is seen in this, this is a case of a sympathetic ophthalmia seen in COVID period. And you see when Professor Biswas published his first paper with cytophotocoagulation inducing a sympathetic ophthalmia, he told that there was pigment migration happens in the site of cytophotocoagulation. And this is the evidence. This patient has a glaucoma in the right eye and there was a uh, cytophotocoagulation and sun. And you can well appreciate that pigment migration here in this area, pigment migration in this area. So this patient is a sympathetic ophthalmia and these are all these findings that are showing in this. Uh, okay, again, the pigment migration being seen here. Now, cytophotocoagulation induced sympathetic ophthalmia and Coats disease that we have also published, which showed a T cell manifestation are more, more, much more than B cell manifestation. Remember, for sympathetic ophthalmia, there is a one concept called Dellen Fuchs nodule. Dellen Fuchs nodule, typically seen in sympathetic ophthalmia, can be seen in VKH, can be seen in sarcoidosis also. But important thing of Dellen Fuchs nodules is that they are in acute manifestation. Now we see this case is a chronic manifestation of a one sympathetic ophthalmia induced by a, a vitreous surgery. These RP atrophy are not Dellen Fuchs nodules. These are just an RP atrophies. Okay, this we published again as a uh, in young patient and uncommon uh, entity. Again here, T cell disease was much more. Now sympathetic ophthalmia mm, sometimes can be. Uh, it is thought one hypothesis is there whether uh, the trauma can induce such thing. Here is the evidence where sympathetic ophthalmia again T cell manifestation was more than and B cell was less in this case. But here is an unusual uh, manifestation of sympathetic ophthalmia. This was seen in a thysical eye with a chronic uh, uh, involvement and patient one was on steroid as well as azoran was given in this patient for a long time now when we see immunohistochemistry here b cell is positive and t cell is less so you see when you are giving a medication targeted to t cells the, the t cell can be depressed in such situation and b cell can be unaffected so you do not get a B cell population in those situation and it can be 
uh, and change or showing an overexpression in some of the situation. Sarcoid is not, actually this is a lupus perineo and a hard uh, granuloma is seen here. Now we see these are the histopathology where the Showman's node uh, calcification that can be seen in the inflammation. Again, it's a marker, T cell is positive, B cell is uh, less here. But important thing is to see this is a chronic case of a sympathetic of uh, sarcoidosis and this is again an acute phase of uh, sarcoidosis and here again the heart brain loma was seen now interestingly this case of sarcoidosis was 20 years okay he's he was a state bank employee and he was working in the bank and he was having this disease for 20 years when you see the and do the uh, immunohistochemistry here cd3 was negative while the cd20 was positive same uh, uh, philosophy acts here in this uh, situation Yeah, I'm last. Uh, uh, now we see stromal coronary. Just to tell you one last this example. This, what do you think? This is a central clearing with this. There's no vitreous cells, okay? Now this is a case of a CSR. So all stromal coronaries may not be a, a immunological or disease or an inflammatory yes, disease. It can be a CSR. So if it is that I've shown you very basic, which is clinical, pathological, and immunological, acute versus chronic. In acute cases, there may be involvement of a, a T cell manifestation. In chronic cases, there may be a B cell um, uh, manifestation. More clinical pathological correlation we need to this uh, in this uh, there. So these are the various workshops that has been done here. I like to thank Professor Bishwas sir for uh, sharing the case, Medical Retina Department and Ocular Pathology Laboratory at Sri Shankar Dimnatala and Professor Narsing Rao, uh, some slides from his lab. Thank you for patiently hearing. Thank you, sir. That was an excellent talk. Can I now invite Dr. Kalpana ma'am to give her comments? Thank you, Deepankar. Actually, I was actually mesmerized with the photographs and uh, the immunological markers. Um, actually, more than me, I think Dr. JB is highly qualified to uh, uh, speak on it, and I would like your comments on that. So, actually, uh, many of the eyes uh, uh, very rarely obtain, except for sympathetic ophthalmia. But if you get such eyes, like I got a few days back in Wigner's gamnomatosis, which is a pain, blind eye. We can now with a lot of immunohistochemical marker, you can find out that uh, immunopathogenesis of these diseases and which helps us to understand. For example, the T cell was not seen in that case of sympathetic ophthalmia and B cell was uh, seen because the patient was treated and then uh, that kind of uh, T cell mediated disease was uh, um, initially though is uh, conventionally seen can be seen in the B cell proliferations also and uh, so, uh, the, there is a also scope for new learning I have done some cases of Eels disease acute retinal necrosis where I could see that there is apart from the infection there is a immune mediated relation uh, mechanism like T cell mediated pathological process is evident so it uh, uh, indicates that uh, apart from the treating the patients with the antimicrobial um, like antiviral treatment we may need to give a oral steroid to control that inflammatory cell infiltration which might be a combination of the t and b cells i just want like thank you so uh, i would just like to ask uh, the punker one question uh, vkh and sarcoid are very similar in terms of especially in the chronic form so is there anything which uh, i mean is the pathogenesis the same or is there something uh, different in this stage because both of them have depigmentation df nodules 
Yeah, if you see, initial manifestation of VKH is a granulomatous disease. Then sometimes it later on it becomes non-granulomatous, and thereafter it becomes a granulomatous form in the chronic stages. But sarcoid, no, because if you see, if sarcoid enters in the chronicity, it does not behave in triphase, tri way. It basically a, 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 a granulomatous disease which can have a and sometimes obviously the T cell and B cell may be there, but in sarcoid pathologically, in chronic form, we get calcification, asteroid body, and showman's body that I've shown you is the characteristic. So we, how to differentiate between a sarcoid granuloma? And sarcoid granuloma is a epithelioid granuloma, which is unlike for the VK granuloma. So there is a difference between. Now for a non-immunologist, like see, we were always taught that uh, all these diseases are uh, T cell based diseases. Yes. I mean, I'm not talking about the cell based or something. So, we were always told in the direction of treating a T cell inhibitor like cyclosporin or voclosporin. So, as a clinician, like, do you think that we should start thinking of changing the mode of direction of therapy? Does it change anyway in that case? No, in uh, for example, if you see to understand anterior weight is prototype is GIA. Okay, again, GIA is a basically a B cell disease. But you see the drug that you are choosing are methotrexate, which is again a more for the T cells. So these are some uh, tricks, even the immunologists may not answer in a straightforward way. Okay, so there are certain things which is very, but once it is a B cell disease, then CD20 and other would be, for example, rituximab adding with a methotrexate would be a better choice in the chronic B cell diseases. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are running short of time. That can I now invite uh, Dr. Vishali Gupta to give her talk on viral anterior uveitis, pearls from the Titan study. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons. Thank you, AIOS, for the opportunity. I would be talking about uh, the treatment algorithm networks for infectious uveitis treatment and focusing on the management of viral anterior uveitis. Uh, these are the results of the Titan group. Uh, so when we come to the herpes, both simplex and VZV, we do understand that herpetic anterior uveitis constitutes about five to 10% of anterior uveitis cases. And mostly you would see the granulomatous forms of uveitis. Uh, you would have the transmission defects, which are very characteristic for HSV. And you can have sometimes the diffuse transillumination defects as well. When we talk of the herpetic eye disease study that did not answer various questions which are related to the management of uveitis. Now coming to CMV, CMV generally produces high intraocular pressure, mild anterior segment inflammation, and especially if you see these coin like, oh sorry, coin-like lesions, they are very, very specific for CMV. We also understand acute CMV uveitis generally responds very well to gancyclovir gel or oral gancyclovir. And for chronic, uh, oral is kind of all of us use them uh, depending on our own choice and preference. Recurrence of inflammation is very common once you stop the maintenance therapy. So SUN2 did a great job in establishing the diagnosis and gave us very clear cut diagnosis when to diagnose CMV, HSV, or VCV uveitis. So CMV is unilateral interior uveitis, positive aquostat for CMV. HSV is again unilateral with either positive tap sectoral iris atrophy in less than 50 years are HSV keratitis and VCV is unilateral anterior uveitis with either positive aqueous tap for VCV, sectoral atrophy more than 60 years and concurrent or recurrent zoster a dermatomal. Now what I'm going to present you is the results of Titan which report one and two where we developed an evidence and experience based consensus guidelines for the management of HSV, VCV, CMV, anterior uveitis. 
uh, to address the lack of international agreement on these conditions. So we had a two round online Delphi survey with blinding of the study team. We collected the responses from 76 international uveitis experts from 21 countries and they were chosen based on more than 15 years of experience in managing uh, uveitis. So the current practices in the diagnosis and treatment of these entities were identified. The working group developed data into consensus guidelines and consensus was defined as a particular response to work specific question where more than 75% of agreement was achieved with an R interquartile range of less than one. So let's see what was the consensus like. Now to begin with, let's see how the experts were distributed. Majority of them were from uh, Asia, including India, Southeast Asia, but it had a fairly global representation. Now let's talk business. So consensus statement for the management of HSV and VZV, experts agreed that the diagnostic feature as defined by Sun were, they all agreed on that, unilaterality, increased IOP. They also added decreased corneal sensation and diffuse our sectoral uh, atrophy because Sun did not talk about these two things. Sectoral atrophy they felt was more critical for diagnosing HSV rather than VZV. So regarding the treatment initiation and uh, monitoring, they felt that initiation of treatment for HSV, VZV, anterior uveitis can be administered even when the result of PCR are pending. So you don't have to really wait for the results to start treatment. PCR does give definitive diagnosis and uh, repeating the PCR for stopping the therapy, nobody recommended. Like you will base on the resolution of inflammation and the reduction in the IOP. They were the two clinical endpoints for monitoring response to therapy, not the negativity of PCR. Topical corticosteroids would be given both in HSV and VZV anterior uveitis and uh, but they would be given only if you have either systemic or topical antiviral coverage. Steroids were the choice not NSAID so you don't have to feel that it is viral related anterior uveitis and you would rather treat it with NSAIDs. Experts did not agree to that. Neither periocular nor systemic corticosteroids were considered to have a role. Beta blocker was the uh, IOP lowering drug of choice, both for HSV, VZV, and because of its simpler dosing regimen, oral valley cyclovir was preferred systemic antiviral for both. Now, if the patient stops treatment, Restarting treatment is necessary only if the disease activity is noted again and for prophylaxis it doesn't have a role. Coming to the active corneal involvement, I don't have to go into because herpetic eye disease study already covered it but experts felt that if there is a corneal involvement, oral antiviral therapy should be considered if not already used and you have to titrate topical corticosteroids depending on what you have. The problem was chronic and recurrent anterior uveitis uh, due to herpes. So there was a substantial disagreement on the treatment of either chronic or recurrent hypertensive uveitis. 51% of the expert would add long-term maintenance with oral antivirals with or without topical steroids for chronic HSV and 44 would add for chronic VZV. Now maintenance antiviral treatment for episodic hypertensive anterior uveitis would be used in 19% for HSV and 18% for VZV. But majority of the experts did agree that if there are two or more episodes of hypertensive uveitis per year, at least half of them, 51% would use a long-term maintenance of oral antiviral. And this discrepancy came, the experts from Asia Pacific 
They were all keen to treat it, but experts from Europe and America, they kind of said they will not treat it, but it would be, they do not see much of herpes anterior uveitis anyways. So I think if I have a choice, I would treat them. So this is the algorithm which we have for herpes, that if you have suggestive signs, which is unilaterality, increased IOP, decreased corneal sensation, sectoral or diffuse iris atrophy, look. Look in the past if there are any classical skin lesions present, like the blister, dermatomal distribution. If there is present, just go ahead, start systemic antiviral, topical steroids, uh, Generally, predacetate was preferred and see the treatment endpoint reduction in the IOP and the resolution of inflammation. Now, suppose patient has this but doesn't have classical skin lesion. Then you consider the aqueous tap for multiplex PCR. If the tap is positive, it's straight away you will start with the treatment. And of course, if IOP is increased, you will add anti-glaucoma. If there is corneal involvement, consider adding topical antiviral. Now, suppose you have started uh, the patient the type of the drugs. If you think it is HSV, then oral valet cyclovir, one gram twice to three times a day for at least two weeks, or you could use a cyclovir, 800 milligram five times a day for two weeks. If it is VZV, then you consider valet cyclovir 1 gram TDS for 14 days or a cyclovir for 14 days. And the maintenance I have already spoken about. If there are two or more recurrent episodes in a year, these are the patients who would merit on maintenance therapy. We are going on to Delphi 3 for the duration of maintenance therapy because the duration was very variable. It varied from six months to five years. Some people will give for six months, average was one year and others will give very long term. We still don't have consensus for that, but hopefully we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, two quick questions. Why specifically they wanted beta blocker? Was there any reason, sub question about that? Uh, because latinopros per se sometimes, sometimes can cause the inflammation and the problem is with the uh, brimonidine also it can induce vasculitis and some granulomatous inflammation so i think they felt beta and pilocarpin like nobody uses so i think they felt beta blocker was the safest one uh, though we did have a choice of dorsolamide as well but majority this is what they chose they chose you know they, they did not have to give us logic why they chose <laughs> but they chose beta blocker so, ma'am about cmv uh, there is a thing that uh, if they have you a topic know, I, current... I had another few slides on cmv but i don't have time that's the report number two <laughs> <laughs> okay so the gancyclovir gel day was there a, yeah cmv uh, gancyclovir gel was the first line of therapy 0.15 uh, percent and uh, they would add the systemic therapy but it was val gan it was not val acyclovir okay. systemic therapy if there were recurrences or if the patient had hiv so how not long they were the using patients. for uh, gan gel for the acute phase and as a maintenance gan uh, on an average three months everybody was treating even for cmv yes um, madam i wanted a question uh, did they did you look into the endothelial counts also in the in the study? Uh, we did ask for the specular personally i do specular you're asking about specular, yeah, specular. No? Yeah. i do it for cmv we did have but majority of the experts said they will not rely on specular count as a response to therapy they would rather reply, uh, rely on the lowering of the iop decreasing the anti-glaucoma medication and uh, decrease in the inflammation you personally feel endothelial count is lesser i mean in your experience in yes it comes back also it comes back also yeah but it's not that i do it for every patient uh, you know it, it doesn't guide me but uh, if you do it it's fun to see the specular count is low or if you can like padma malni can do con focal our cornea people take hours to do it yeah. and they don't <laughs> do it with pleasure so you know you can't rely on them but if you see those all like inclusions, if you see low specular count, 
then it's kind of substantiates the diagnosis of CMV. Okay. Anybody in the audience has any question? I just have one question, ma'am. In viral anterior uveitis, most of the times we see desmond membrane folds and uh, pigment and KPs. Do you think these are important? It was not uh, included in the... Uh, they are important, but uh, they are not very diagnostic only for viral anterior uveitis. So these are the features which are more that take you in that direction. Because corneal folds can be seen in lot of acute uveitis where the IOP has really gone down due to ciliary body shutdown. So it's an important feature, but it's not, experts not felt it was not, not very so specific important. for viral. Okay. Thank you. You'll not be able to get her, so any more questions, she's going <laughs> to the retina symposium next. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. So, thanks uh, for the speakers once again. Over the second half, we are moving on to the cases. So, JB, sir, first of all, like, uh, uh, congratulations on behalf of everyone. He's won the AOS Lifetime Achievement Award. So, all of, all of us, uh, please come on. Yes, sir. So, I mean, all of us are students directly or indirectly. So, by some form, either direct students or Ekalavia type students. So, we would like to hear frosted branch angitis in a child. This is not an HIV patient, but I will present a very rare case. This is a case presentation. This is a five-year-old boy. He had sudden painless loss of vision in both eyes uh, for 11 days. Parents was obviously very concerned. He consulted the local ophthalmologist and has put on only topical steroids and cycloplegics. His history is very remarkable of having a maculopapular rash over his thighs and buttocks and a fever which lasted for four days. He has anti antenatal, prenat perinatal and postnatal history as non-contributory. Vaccination dose as per the Indian National Vaccination Schedule. Both base culture visual acuity is the distance vision 3 by 60 in both eyes, near vision in 24. External examination showed no abnormality. Antisemite normal except some mild circumcongenital congestion, otherwise quiet. And look at the fundus. There is a total perivenous shaking of the vessels and uh, you can see the both eyes have got symmetrical picture and they are exudates over the macular area. We did the autofluorescence. Autofluorescence picked up the uh, hyper autofluorescence at the macular area showing that the uh, uh, plaque like lesion. Fundus fluorescent angiogram swept source uh, within and doing the vessels to the corresponding doesn't show much information and um, some disc and perivascular leakage was seen. And this is Swepsos optical coherence tomography. It showed subretinal fluid. It can, you can see the subretinal fluid along with the hard exudates, along with the hyperreflective foci. And SSOCTA showed uh, superficial and deep capillary plexus highlight areas of flow wide area in the right and left eye respectively. What could be the diagnosis? Obviously it's a frosted branch angitis but what could be the cause? So it's important to do as uh, Dr. Uh, Shoma was telling that to do that uh, investigations. In fact there is a lot of investigations in this case was done. Complete and differential blood count within normal limit. Mantua was negative. Chest excess there are may see liver function test blood urea creatine in normal limits. In such cases, no, you need to do that lot of investigations. And the children, serology may be helpful. Toxoplasma gondii, herpes simplex, virus, cytomegalovirus, treponoma pallidum, HIV, all negative. What came out positive is the anti-rubella antibody. Uh, there's a 44.08 international unit per ml. And anti EBV highway is a high sky high for 420 international unit per ml. Actually, this has been advised by Dr. Narsila, whom I consulted. He said that do the uh, ABV virus serology. 
So EBV virus uh, IgG was positive. In the 420 normal is 0 to 18 is the IgG level. And there's a mild hypochromic microcystic anemia was. So diagnosis is based on the clinical and incident investigation, bilateral frosted bunch angiitis, and possible cause was Epstein Barr virus. Pediatric consultation was obtained, and the patient was put on intravenous methyl prednisone based on the severity of the inflammation, 250 milligram per day for three consecutive days, oral steroid 20 milligram per day according to the body weight, oral val acyclovir 500 milligram thrice a day. And you can see that there's a, the patient had sequential examination over six months, and there's a complete resolution of uh, retinal vasculitis. And fortunately, the base corrected visual acuity improved significantly, 6.9 in the right eye, 6.15 in the left eye. There was a scar over the macular area in the uh, left eye, but the right eye is almost nil. So what is very interesting is that we did the anti-EBV titer again, and there's a decline in the anti-EBV titer uh, post-treatment, 225.11 uh, international unit per ml. So this is a case of frosted branch angiitis, which is a rare but severe form of retinal vasculitis. We tend to see it in HIV positive patients more commonly and um, is classified in the two types based on the presence of underlying ocular and systemic inflammation. It can be primary idiopathic or it can be immunocompromised, as I mentioned, CMB infection, toxoplasmosis. There are incidences of report of TB, systemic lupus erythematous, bases, Crohn's, leukemia, and lymphoma has been described. So our case with the history of rash and fever, a decline in the anti-EBV titer, and responsiveness to uh, steroid therapy, EBV seems to the most possible etiology in this case. So we looked in the literature there before us, there's a one case of frosted bunch angiitis versus the Epstein Barr virus in a seven year old boy has been reported. And our is the next case which was published in the ocular imaging and inflammation, this multimodal imaging in a case of bilateral frosted bunch angiitis in a five year old boy, secondary to the Epstein Barr virus infection. So I look forward for your comments. Such an interesting case. Actually, we would have never thought of EBV at all. <laughs> uh, can so, I uh, yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to ask, like, what might be the pathology, you know, pathogenesis that goes behind frosted branch? I mean, we typically see retinal vasculitis as skip or confluent lesions, yeah. but this involves the entire. And we know that frosted branch happens with so many organisms. So what might be happening which is different in frosted branch compared to other? Uh... I'm not very sure about that frosted branch angiitis, but I, it, it feels that it's a kind of a severe uh, inflammation. The type of the inflammation is much more severe than the normal uh, uh, is acute and uh, is severe and uh, it produces a lot of times the macular changes. So most of the frosted branch which uh, has been reported are in children. So is it yeah. anything to do with their immune system, the robust immune system, which probably would have... I, I really don't know. Can it be because EB virus causes infectious mononucleosis? Yes. It causes Burkitt lymphoma. Again, you see those are basically a B cell lymphoma, no, they can have a vasculitis component which is much more evident. Can it be a reason for that, sir? I'm not sure. So, I'm not, I just want to think when uh, even when you find so much of vasculitis in otherwise non frosted branch, so you get some occlusive features in the periphery, but in frosted branch, you don't get. So, is no, it less severe than that? Does it mean that it's a relatively less kind of vasculitis compared to the other one? I would. Uh... I would rather see that is a whole basis a sheet. So I would rather. So how much should we rely that? upon EB virus? Because we have a study together where like we, it was incidental finding in one uh, set of CMV retinitis patients, and we did intraocular specimen evaluation about 15 years back. So uh, in a children, uh, in a children with EB virus, uh, uh, tight tighter and then dropping of the 
Uh, viral serology is indicating. Post treatment is an indication. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So let's move on to the. Sorry, uh, one last question. So uh, the before the result, uh, as the patient had severe inflammation, we didn't wait for that uh, serology results. We started the IVMP, but ideally you should be given under cover of antiviral medication. This is not a typical viral retinitis presentation, so that way probably you, we got away with it. But otherwise, probably the take-home message is when you suspect viral, then don't give IVMP. So probably you start off uh, investigations, and at the most you can have oral. Uh, anti-inflammatory therapy but not uh, local steroids again so let's move on to the next case presentation measles associated retinopathy i invite dr sopnil parchan six minutes sir thank you ma'am so i'll be presenting two cases of measles associated retinopathy so this is the first case, he is 20 year old male and he complained of sudden loss of vision in uh, right eye since one month and he has history of hemiplegia one month back and was admitted at tertiary, eye, uh, tertiary care multi-speciality hospital. Uh, vision in right eye was PR uh, present, uh, PR inaccurate, uh, there was RAPD and uh, this was the images which was sent to me by the referring ophthalmologist, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this image was taken uh with a smartphone so she said that uh, there is a picture of crao but uh, she could not explain the hemorrhages which were there at the center and oct was not correlating with the diagnosis of crao so in this picture we can see that there is a uh, pale disc there is arterial attenuation uh, there is retinal opacification and in center there are few scattered hemorrhages and on oct you can see that whole retinal architecture is uh, distorted uh, there is moth hidden appearance of the retinal tissue and uh, the characteristic finding which you can see is the ILM is intact and there is ballooning of ILM. So this was the picture when this patient presented to us. So you can see that uh, this picture was after one week of the last images. So there is this disc pallor and there is arterial attenuation and the uh, uh, normal sheen of the retina is lost. There are this kisses cavities and there is the scarring at the fovea. So this was the angiogram, there was hypofluorescence and which remain hypofluorescence in the late phase. And this was the OCT which was done by us. Again, you can yeah, see that coming. ILM is intact, uh, the retinal architecture is destroyed and there are these kisses cavities. Uh, this is left eye, left eye was absolutely normal. And this MRI, he had this MRI report, so which showed that there is altered sig signal intensity in right temporal lobe, right basal ganglia reaching up to genu of the internal capsule and it is involving extending till caudate nucleus and most importantly it was showing that it is predominantly in, uh, involving the white matter and uh, the gray white matter was differentiated it was maintained so uh, since uh, we had this oct images with ilm ballooning intact ilm we advised measles serology and uh, the igg uh, for measles was high and it was positive and on retrospective history, did they, he did give history of measles during childhood. And this patient was further referred back to his multi-speciality hospital for the treatment. This is case two. He is a 30 year old male and he complained of sudden loss of vision in right eye. Uh, he, this patient gave history of measles at the age of five years. At presentation in vision in right eye was counting finger one meter. Again, he has RAPD, left eye was normal. This was the fundus picture at presentation. You can see that the media is fairly clear. There was no vitritis. The disc was normal. There was this area of retinal opacification which was centered around the fovea and there was this another PD like retinitis lesion. Uh, left eye was normal. This is in high magnification. You can see this uh, yellowish white area of retinal opacification which is clearing in the nasally with some scarring. So again, uh, angiography showed some subtle leakage in the nasal part of this lesion and o OCT again showed this ballooning of ILM and there is ILM is intact. There is hyper reflectivity involving the inner retinal layers and this kisses cavities. So again, in this patient, uh, the measles titer were raised serum as well as CSF 
tighter were also quite traced but interestingly he did not have any cns uh, clinical it was normal mri was normal and eeg was also normal and this patient was advised interferon therapy but he did not agree for the treatment and loss to follow so to discuss uh, if we see the diagnostic criteria of ssp it actually lacks the ocular finding but if we see almost 50% of the patient of ssp has some of form of ocular involvement most of this patient have bilateral one eye followed by the other and most characteristic involvement of uh, measles associated retinopathy is involvement of the macula which might be in the form of it can have various presentation it can have macular chorioretinitis it can have retinal edema retinal folds or hemorrhagic uh, retinitis and in late stage all leaf macular pigmentary disturbances so if the patient only have this ocular feature it might be uh, difficult to diagnose in the absence of ssp but uh, this is something a very important sign on oct which uh, we can see that is there is total disintegration or necrosis of the retinal layers but it spares the ilm and brooks membrane and most importantly it shows ilm ballooning and uh, subsequently if we do anti measles antibody so they are a diagnostic of ssp so the last case we did publish in ocular immunology and inflammation and uh, our co-author was uh, dr partha pratim sir so that was about uh, measles associated retinopathy thank you thank you sapnil can dr partha comment he's ready thanks sapnil a uh, very nice case actually this case when sapnil sent to me uh, uh, there was a little bit of challenge in this because the neurologist when you refer this patient to uh, such patient to neurologist they follow the dikin criteria so now the dikin criteria says that the five there are five criteria like one is your uh, behavioral changes the number two is eeg characteristic eeg changes and then uh, uh, there is a uh, csf globulin level csf antibody for the measles and the fifth one is your brain biopsy right. so if you follow these patients there was uh, patient uh, did not have any behavioral changes eeg was normal and so the neurologist was reluctant to uh, do the csf tap so i convinced him saying that the sir please do the tap because the oct picture is so characteristic of uh, measles retinopathy kindly do that so finally he agreed and the everything was globulin csf globulin was raised uh, sorry csf antibody titer was raised and they also presented in their meeting and uh, discuss about that so i think the moral of the story is that you have to if if we if you are clinically uh, suspecting that measles retinopathy you have to talk to your neurologist because they follow the dikin criteria and sometimes it is not all the criterias are not actually uh, fulfilled in this cases so uh, only based on the clinical suspicion you should talk to the neurologist okay. and convince them to do the csf tap thank you can i ask one question only concern is that no after the measles 6 to 7 years there is a ssp can occur now in this situation is there any marker that can tell you that the patient may develop ssp or we all in india we are vaccinated with mmr vaccination in our childhood is there a role of secondary vaccination in this cases because there are already there is a optic nerve changes have already happened in this patient uh, thanks for the comment uh, dr dipankar hitesh can we move on to the next one by then by then when hitesh comes up one thing we are we should be worried uh, talking to the neurologist is that it's not that everything all is well that ends well in uh, adults the same ssp in child we have heard mortalities so be aware of the situation thank you sir uh, i'll present two cases which were little uh, little atypical so what i thought and what it turned out so first case is a 30 years old healthy female a housewife she complained of painless drop in vision from the right eye since a month there was history of fever and severe headache with onset of the eye complaints her past ocular medical history were insignificant so on examination the best corrected visual acuity was uh, 618 and 36 in the right eye and left eye it was 66 and 6 iop was normal anterior segment showed mild reaction and left eye was quite 
so on fundus uh, photo uh, you can see a uh, subretinal fluid pocket at the macula in the right eye left eye looked normal on angiography there were multiple pinpoint leakages and disc staining and mild leak b scan showed uh, increased in uh, choroidal thickness and the swepso society showed subretinal fluid with septa and the basilar layer detachment so provisional diagnosis of acute probably vkh uh, typical was made she was advised blood test and fitness for systemic steroids on blood test the wbc uh, count was raised and the peripheral blood smear was done which showed 95% of blast cells so these were the blast cells on the peripheral blood smear so referred to a hematologist who diagnosed it to be a case of acute myeloid leukemia so again we published this and pmr sir is the co-author and jb sir is also the co-author in this case so this was little atypical so coming to the second case so this is a 12 years old healthy female she visited our hospital in december 2016 she noticed that she could not see from the right eye lower half since two days when she closed the left eye and the best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 69 n6 left eye was 66 n6 she was seen by a resident and then referred to our neuro ophthalmologist who diagnosed it to have optic uh, disc pallor in the right eye and rest was stable she was done extensive workup from the neuro ophthal point of view blood test mri brain orbit which were normal the field was done which showed the typical uh, the hemi field defect which was uh, uh, which she complained and the left eye was normal this was in 2016 she was under treatment but the field defect didn't improve she didn't had any other complaints this was in 2018 19 then in december 2020 when she was 16 years old she complained of pain and redness in the same eye since 2 months her vision was more or less the same and then she gave a history of pencil tip injury to the right eye at the age of at 6 months of age so this was the right eye she had this pain congestion tenderness in the right eye and a subconjunctival blackish lesion was seen and probably that was the pencil tip the graphite or the lead and the scarring you can see which could be the point of entry of the pencil tip so this is the enlarged image so and this is the optic nerve uh, this uh, right eye optic nerve had photo which showed the pallor and the cupping so earlier photographs i i don't have so this is the picture in 2020 so again the field effects were more or less the same in the right eye left eye was absolutely normal so probable diagnosis of od optic nerve uh, uh, optic neuropathy with scleritis was made so scleritis workup was done which was negative except positive mon2 but she had multiple recurrences in spite of oral steroids so went back to literature and in which uh, it has been documented that the graphite foreign body can lead to subsequent inflammation even after 20 years plus the graphite foreign body can lead to optic neuropathy so probably thought that since the scleritis workup is normal and there, there is literature supporting the uh, cause of the uh, optic neuropathy and the scleritis we advised for the conjunctival biopsy and exploration which was done by dr akshay nair at our hospital and the biopsy reporting was done by dr indumathi gopinathan who is akshay's mother so she is a renowned pathologist this is the pathological slide which showed pencil core granuloma so but in spite of this she had multiple recurrences she was on uh, she was on uh, recurrent this uh, steroids and even immunosuppressants we had given so i had referred to pmr sir and at sn and at sn mon2 was positive quantiferon was positive hrct was uh, they it showed viral pneumonitis but she revealed history of tb in almost everyone in her family and mother had mdr tb so started on att after chest physician opinion the points towards starting att were like strong history of contact nodular or a localized 
variety of scleritis not responding to standard immunosuppressives and steroids and plus the graphite particles now have been removed so there was persistent inflammation so she completed 6 months of ATT in February 2022 and there have been no recurrences after the course of ATT so this was in June 22 and the surprisingly the optic nerve looked a bit healthy or maybe better than the earlier photograph this was the old photograph December 2020 and in June 2022 it looked little better but the field effect remained the same so questions to my seniors and teachers what's the cause of scleritis and the optic neuropathy TB or graphite foreign body cause of optic neuropathy and the scleritis have they seen any cases like uh, graphite or pencil core uh, related granuloma and if there is recurrences now how do we treat especially even now her sister has been diagnosed to have MDRTB. I would like to thank my teachers at RIO and Shankar Netralev. Thank you. So, I will take this opportunity to invite to the annual conference of the USA. Thank you. So, interesting case, Hitesh. But then we will call upon the next speaker. Um, I mean, there are too many variables in your uh, case. Only I think time will tell. Uh, you know, there is an immunological reaction already and then there is also a bug which is not like you've just treated it on the basis of uh, the family history and all that. So I think the answer will be I think just wait and watch and see, you know, how uh, this patient responds. Okay. Thank you. Sir, for want of Thanks. time, let's move on to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Syed Mohideen, tackling so, CNVM, inflammatory CNVM. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank the chair for giving me the opportunity. anti is one of the most abused medicine in ophthalmology and uh, it has been used in uh, coronal granuloma as well. We all know that intraocular TB causes a manifold manifestation and uh, being coronal pathology being one of the commonest manifestations. And ATT and oral steroids is the mainstay in the management of ocular TB. But because the mycobacterium granuloma are associated with high vascularity and angiogenesis, anti vegf also has been used. And intravitreal injection of anti vegf has been used as an adjunctive in this granuloma. Here we present like two cases where we used anti vegf in granuloma. A 26 year old man came with a congruence of sudden onset of diminished vision. He had no, any syst no systemic illness. He presented with a vision of 660 in the left eye. Anti segment was normal, and the left eye we had a nice uh, granulous yellowish lesion in the just superior to the fovea with a cystic lesion at the level of fovea. And we did the investigation. OCT showed a contact sign with a choroidal elevation, and the OCT at the level of cystic lesion showed a basilar layer detachment. So he presented with basilar layer detachment and a granuloma. And we started with we did investigation, we found out that Manto was positive, and rest all investigation was negative. So we diagnosed as a presumed ocular TB and treated him with. Uh, uh, treated with the ATT4 drug regimen and steroids. Later on, the like after a week, the lesion resolved nicely. The BLD and the granuloma resolved nicely. And uh, at around two months later, he presented with the CNVM. That is, he had developed a scar with a little bit of hemorrhage and subretinal fluid. And uh, the OCT showed uh, intraretinal edema and SRF. So we gave intravital injection Avastin for this case patient. And uh, the OCT angiograph also showed a nice. Uh, uh, CNVM complex and the complex resolved well with a single dose of Avastin and the, ultimately the patient lost for follow-up and in this case they presented with the uh, like a BLD in the early stage and the CNVM at a later stage and we responded with, with anti -HF. Our second case uh, is another interesting case like uh, she presented with a defective vision of one week duration and the BCV was 6-6 uh, six, six in the right eye and 6 by 12 in the left eye. Anti-segment examination was normal and left eye showed a nice big yellowish lesion of about 2 this diameter just next to the fovea and uh, like uh, OCT showed a contact sign and we did an investigation ESR was raised and Manto was positive Restall investigation are negative so we, we started uh, we uh, made a diagnosis of presumed ocular tuberculosis and we started with the 884 drug with the oral cigarettes in a tapering dose but uh, two months later the lesion persisted like the same the granuloma was the uh, same size with the surrounding intraretinal fluid, it does not resolve adequately. 
so we did ultrasound because the looks the lesion looks a little bit amal or not so we did ultrasound it showed a nice uh, cystic lesion with hypoechoic thickened wall and a hypoechoic center then we did a ffa which picked up the diagnosis like it has a very rich vascularity and the ffa was very much hyperfluorescent at the later phases so we diagnosed a, we made a diagnosis of a vascularized corridor granuloma so we continued her with att and we advised her intravital bevacizumab and the lesion responded well with bevacizumab that is one month later the lesion decreased in size and the srf also decreased we went ahead with second injection and the lesion almost like gone, gone for a scar and the srf also decreased very nicely so this is the pre you know, like injection treatment and post injection where the lesion is resolved nicely so coming to the discussion like hypoxia and increased wedge of expression has been demonstrated in lungs and the extra pulmonary sites in tuberculosis granuloma and wedge of levels also used as a marker in active tuberculosis and increased wedge level of wedge uh, has been reported in photoreceptors in rp in animal models so pharmacological invasion of wedge has been uh, like uh, found to be decreasing the infection load and reducing the angiogenesis in granuloma and limiting the spread of infection so in addition to inflammatory granuloma uh, inflammatory cnvm intravitreal anti wedge has a role uh, in combination with systemic att or steroids in vascular risk granuloma the uh, first successful treatment has been published by uh, like uh, kalpana madam where they have treated with uh, uh, three dose of avastin uh, before that uh, previously they were used to treat with either pdt or uh, cryotherapy and uh, in uh, rima bansal and all they also described a granuloma where they have given multiple injections of avastin and they have treated a recurrence with a single dose of avastin and uh, not only uh, uh, coronal granuloma like optic nerve granuloma also shown to be respond well with the uh, anti wedge when combined with the att and steroids and uh, it also been used in paradoxical worsening of uh, uh, serous detachment in case of granulomas and uh, uh, salil jain at all they also published a report in which a large coronal granuloma has been treated with anti wedge alone without att they have treated with anti wedge alone for coronal granuloma so to conclude anti wedge therapy to be considered to a granuloma if there is a secondary cnvm or if it is large and vascularized if you have an extensive exudation or serous detachment or if it is not responding to uh, conventional therapy with att or steroid thank you thank you thank you said that was excellent well managed cases okay. so for want of time i think we should go on to the next case okay. very good i now invite uh, dr minij anand diagnostic dilemma I would like to thank Dr. Somshila and the UAD Society for giving me an opportunity. So I, I thought like you should uh, mention the title. Yes. Like, like, <laughs> <just like, laughs> so mine is a 41-year-old male. Came with complaints <laughs> of redness in both the eyes since 20 days and diminution of vision in the left eye since five days. No significant history in the past. On examination, right eye was normal except for anterior chamber was shallow with Van Herrick's two, and the left eye had 618 N18 vision. IOP was normal. Again, the AC was shallow, and this is more striking here. The anterior chamber being shallow, that is only significant finding in the anterior chamber. So the glaucoma patient went to the glaucoma department, was diagnosed as primary angle closure glaucoma. AC PI was done in both the eyes. Patient came for follow up for fundus evaluation. On fundus evaluation, the right eye showed disc hyperemia. You can see the ILM falls with the macula. With a on a detailed evaluation, there was an inferior uh, coronal detachment. The left eye had mild disc hyperemia. You can see the subretinal yellowish lesion nasal to the disc and superotemporal uh, area. There is a coronal detachment, 360 degree, exudative retinal detachment, and OCT showed again there is undulation of the RP, subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid, and hyperreflective dots. The B scan showed RCS thickening in both the eyes, the left eye more than the right eye, and there was a coronal detachment in the left eye. So again, the confusion of diagnosis. I'm sure now the VKH is now you know a lot of is masquerading. So we had a diagnosis whether it is a type three uveal issue effusion syndrome, atypical VKH, CSCR, or a posterior scleritis. So as usual, routine workup was done and FFA ICG was ordered. The FFA, the right eye showed peripheral vascular leak, whereas the left eye, you can see the nasal. There are pinpoint leaks, but it's like an ink blot kind of leaks. There's no vessel leakage. The ICG right eye was okay. The left eye showed persisting hyposinusins in the nasal and the lesion, which I showed the subretinal lesion that was still hyposins even in the late phase of the angio. The UBM, the ultrasound biomicroscopy showed cilia, the supracoroidal fluid and ciliary body rotation in 360 degree, but it was seen in both the eyes. 
so we worked up the case and everything was negative all the infective etiology was negative and serum cortisol also was done thinking are we dealing with an csc the treatment patient was started on vicelon 1 mg per kg body weight and one week follow off you can see the subretinal fibrin was increasing so again we had a doubt are we dealing with csc here or is inflammatory or a non inflammatory pathology but still i had a consultation with dr mahesh also and then we continued the steroid he felt it is inflammatory and not csc and you can see the choroidal detachment is still exudative rd is still persisting those subretinal fibrin you can see they're still there and you can see this oct it is the the characteristic was increased choroidal thickness in this patient there was significant increase in the choroidal thickness the hyperreflective dots those was a little confusing whether are we dealing with an inflammatory or a non inflammatory etiology because we know that even a type 3 ues you can have this fluid subretinal fluid the choroid was thickened even in the other eye so this was the on the presentation you can see the choroidal thickness is decreasing with steroids and so we had a doubt are we dealing again with an csc so we repeated an ffa the right eye was same per peripheral leakage the left eye those whatever the leak was burst that is gone away so the question here is now is it type 3 i want the panelist to let me know if it's type 3 ues which i'm dealing with or it is atypical vkh because now we have that bilateral pachycoroid with uvl effusion syndrome so the treatment differs if it is an inflammatory or a non inflammatory etiology and still the non exudative I mean, exudative rd is still not resolved so do we need to do anything like a subretinal drainage or analysis i want the opinion from the expert padma you want to answer basically there definitely there is a combination of inflammatory and also the csc component is there so we have to address both this is like a csa effect when you increase anti inflammatory the exudative and cd will increase so i think we need to address both I just want. I think Dr. Basu is a VR surgeon. Do you think the type three uvula fusion syndrome, which we're dealing with, a sclerectomy? Because the VK, the picture is somewhat like a VK and the uvula fusion. Because now, now I think there was a published in BMC ophthalmology bilateral pachycoroid with a type three uvas, which had a similar kind of leak. Because the leakage is not so characteristic of VK nor CSC. Because if it was a CSC, that subretinal fibrin wouldn't have got resolved with the steroid. So that's where. the confusion is i <laughs> so um the question is those pinpoint leaks which you were seeing i mean would it make a difference if you could laser i and, just wanted uh, to, i was uh, planning for a because yeah. anyway this patient is on steroid Correct. and there is a variation in the choroidal thickness <laughs> okay. uh in terms of but so uh, maybe, but uh, when i repeated the fa that leaks went away so that's why i had a discuss with dr mahesh hmm. and uh, I told I laser. Then sir said, no, it's not. It's not uh, CSC. It's more in favor of an inflammatory etiology because that OCT, the hyperreflective dots, you don't see much in UUAS, sir. But it, it's, it's a spectrum where you know again there is a confusion about. See, the only thing unusual about the VKH is the disc appears okay all along, in spite yeah. of this extensive amount of. Maybe I think you should also look for if these patients are on any other drugs or anything which. No, he's uh, not on. Then I saw an article on tuberculous posterior scleroveitis, which had a similar kind of presentation where you know. So that's the reason I did a workup for the TB. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done the workup for TB. As you said, you should do an you shouldn't do an unnecessary investigation on the patient. So that's and I found an article, so I did. But recently, I just found a similar kind with uvea uvs pachycoroid with uvas. So I think the probably the effect will be to just hold on to the steroid because. and okay. watch him closer now i've just had yeah. an imt also even a modulator thinking that if it is inflammatory maybe it will yeah that complement stop the steroids continue with immunosuppression Correct. see the response if it is not responding surgery is a last resort if i can say okay. but not at this stage okay thank you dr manisha let's move on to the next case uh, i invite dr rajwinder it's running by then she starts off the case sunny has a comment it's a
Thanks. Th Can you start? Thank you, USA, for giving me an uh, opportunity to speak in front of UV experts. Thank you. It's not moving. It's not moving. So I am grateful to my mentors. Case one. 29-year-old female presented in IOPD two months back with a chief complaint of blurring of vision right eye for three days. And uh, the, um, no uh, relevant other history uh, except the history of similar complaint in the past in left eye for which uh, the patient underwent treatment and recovered well. And she, the vision in the right was uh, best corrected vision was 6 by 60. Other things were normal. And on the right, uh, examination, uh, anterior chamber showed uh, um, anterior chamber cells sclera and iris were normal lens was faking so we can see here the disc edema with the multiple deep ill-defined yellowish lesions with the pocket of subretinal fluid at the posterior pole and the left eye showed the few healed lesions fundus autofluorescence imaging shows the hyper autofluorescent lesion with the central hypo uh, autofluorescence the three dots with the uh, hypofluorescent and the hyperfluorescent uh, uh, corresponding to the fluid FFA shows the multiple choroiditis in the inferior temporal quadrant, uh, uh, which were hypofluorescent in the early phases and hyperfluorescent in the late phases, and al along with the pooling uh, in the area of the uh, fluid. And there is a ballad hyperreflective dots with ritus and elevation near the disc margin. We can see the granuloma uh, here uh, in the OCT. And the patient was started on the topical treatment for the right eye, prednisolone, nep and nep of neck. And patient was asked to get back with investigations report. And decision of starting the oral steroids, uh, steroid was to be taken. Montuk's test was read after 72 hours, highly positive. And uh, HRCT's uh, chest showed the tiny calcified nodule in uh, epico posterior segment of left upper lobe, suggestive of post infection. Patient was offered a diagnosis of ocular. Uh, tuberculosis and advised to start the anti-tubercular treatment after consulting this uh, physician and she was the treatment was started along with the steroids and we can see the uh, uh, improvement in the uh, fundus picture and also uh, in the OCT the resolution of the bell and the hyperreflective material is noted over the RPE so the vision uh, on the presentation was 6 by 60 and the OCT and uh, correspond uh, the vision improved to 6 by 18 so this case uh, as there was granuloma, but the patient uh, didn't give uh, any consent for the anti-VEGF in this case, and she was treated only with the anti-TB drugs and uh, uh, the oral steroids, and uh, she is maintaining the good vision. Good vision. The, another case: choroidal tubercle to choroidal granuloma. A 14-year-old female was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit with a complaint of altered sensorium and irritability. History of fever on her for since one month, along with the headache, nausea, and vomiting since one week. So, uh, the meningeal irritations, cunning, Brudzinski sign, neck rigidity was present. On dilated fundoscopy, the multiple choroidal uh, tubercles with the disc edema, both eyes were seen. The fundus picture has been taken with the MRI cam. So, we can see in the picture uh, the choroidal tubercles in the both eyes and fung uh, fundus picture on the fundus camera which show papilledema with the um, later on the picture was taken uh, showing the healing tubercles both eyes except one tubercle which progressed to the choroidal granuloma so uh, they were uh, advised to get the csf cytology ecl and cb net which came out to be positive for the tp so he here is the multiple imaging of the uh, tuberculous choroidal granuloma. The color photograph showed the granuloma with the pocket of subretinal fluid. Fundus autofluorescence imaging shows the hyper autofluorescent lesion with the central hypo autofluorescence. Near infrared reflectance revealed the hyperreflective lesion with the hyperreflective halo. So the enhanced depth imaging of the SDOCT show through the central lesion of granuloma shows the smooth choroidal elevation with the localized obscuration of the choroidal detail and secondary outer retinal disruption of the photoreceptor ellipsoid layer through the outer nuclear layer by the hyperreflective material that is contact side and the lobulated hypo isoreflective choroidal lesion with loss of vascular pattern and dome shaped elevation of the overlying retina three dimension view of the choroidal granuloma with the tiny pockets of subretinal fluid at the apex of the lesion and hyperreflective infiltrate with the local disruption of the outer retina and retinal pigment epithelium was suggestive of the um, activity then the demonstrated uh, resolution of the tubercle with treatment restoring the normal choroidal vasculature with increased the signal transmission effect was seen behind 
So this patient showed uh, the MRI brain also showed the ring enhancing lesions in the bilateral. So the treatment was started and um, we, along with the oral steroids. So these are the two cases and the as the vision was in the second case was six by six so they didn't give any consent for the anti-VEGF so both the patients were treated with the anti-TB drugs and along with the um, steroids thank, thank you. you thanks a lot um, the tale of TB continues so it never ends so I think I guess like I thank everyone for having the patient hearing and hope we transmitted enough knowledge and the show stops now <laughs> <laughs> sir, sir, dear sir, thanks for very. Yes, sir. Sorry, one question. Sir. One, one question. Uh, post IVMP, is there any necessity to monitor systemic tuberculosis in Indian scenario? I, I think it, uh, you need to monitor post IVMP in a non uh, tuberculosis no. patient or non non ocular tuberculosis, systemic tuberculosis manifestation in in, 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 in Indian scenario. No, Any IV presentations? Meter, I mean, for now what? The specific question why I am asking is my aunt is 70 year old. Post IVMP, she developed an anterior wedge fracture and it turned out to be tuberculosis. So, I don't know the, the scenario in the Indian scenario. I just wanted to just have a question. What is the incidence of systemic tuberculosis post IVMP? No, it's very low. See, IVMP for what indication it was given? No, she was given for corneal transplant uh, graft failure. Yeah. See. The tale of TB continues, so it never ends. So I think I guess like I thank everyone for having the patient hearing and hope we transmitted enough knowledge. And the show stops now. <laughs> so, 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 dear sir, thanks for very. Yes, one, sir. Sorry, one sir. Question. One, one question. Uh, post IVMP, is there any necessity to monitor systemic tuberculosis in Indian scenario? I, I think it, uh, you need to monitor post IVMP in a non uh, tuberculosis patient. No. Or non non ocular tuberculosis, systemic tuberculosis manifestation in in, 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 in Indian scenario. No, any IV presentations? Meter, uh, I mean, for now what? The specific question why I am asking is my aunt is 70 year old. Post IVMP, she developed an anterior wedge fracture and it turned out to be tuberculosis. So, I don't know the, the scenario in the Indian scenario. I just wanted to just have a question. What is the incidence of systemic tuberculosis post IVMP? No, it's very low. See, IVMP for what indication it was given? No, she was given for corneal transplant uh, graft failure. See.